So this is our Aswapati's journey, his descent into the night. He's still going down further and further. A lone discoverer in these menacing realms, guarded like termite cities from the sun, oppressed mid crowd and tramp and noise and flare, passing from dusk to deeper dangerous dusk. He wrestled with powers that snatched from mind its light and smote from him their clinging influences. Soon he emerged in a dim, wallless space. For now the peopled tracts were left behind. He walked between wide banks of failing eve. Around him grew a gaunt spiritual blank a threatening waste, a sinister loneliness that left mind bare to an unseen assault, an empty page on which all that willed could write stark, monstrous messages without control. A traveling dot on downward roads of dusk, mid barren fields and barns and straggling huts and a few crooked and phantasmal trees. He faced a sense of death and conscious void. But still a hostile life unseen was there, whose death-like poise resisted light and truth, made living a bleak gap in nullity. He heard the grisly voices that deny assailed by thoughts that swarmed like spectral hordes, a prey to the staring phantoms of the gloom and terror approaching with its lethal mouth, driven by a strange will down, ever down. The sky above a communique of doom. He strove to shield his spirit from despair, but felt the horror of the growing night and the abyss rising to claim his soul. Then, ceased the abodes of creatures and their forms, and solitude wrapped him in its voiceless folds. All vanished suddenly like a thought expunged. His spirit became an empty, listening gulf, void, of the dead illusion of a world. Nothing was left, not even an evil face. He was alone with the grey python night. A dense and nameless nothing, 
unconscious, mute, which seemed alive but without body or mind, lusted all beings to annihilate that it might be forever nude and soul. As in a shapeless beast's intangible jaws grip strangled by that lusting, viscous blot, attracted to some black and giant mouth and swallowing throat and a huge belly of doom. His being from its own vision disappeared, drawn towards depths that hungered for its fall. A formless void oppressed his struggling brain. A darkness grim and cold benumbed his flesh. A whispered grey suggestion chilled his heart, hailed by a serpent force from its warm home and dragged to extinction in bleak vacancy, life clung to its seat with cords of gasping breath. Lapped was his body by a tenebrous tongue. Existence smothered, travailed to survive. Hope strangled, perished in his empty soul. Belief and memory abolished, died, and all that helps the spirit in its course. There crawled through every tense and aching nerve, leaving behind its poignant quaking trail, a nameless and unutterable fear. As a sea nears a victim bound and still, the approach alarmed his mind forever dumb of an implacable eternity of pain, inhuman and intolerable. This he must bear, his hope of heaven estranged. He must ever exist without extinction's peace in a slow suffering time and tortured space, an anguished nothingness his endless state. A lifeless vacancy was now his breast, and in the place where once was luminous thought, only remained like a pale, motionless ghost, an incapacity for faith and hope, and the dread conviction of a vanquished soul, immortal still, but with its Godhead lost, self lost, and God, and touch of happier worlds.
but he endured, stilled the vain terror, bore the smothering coils of agony and affright. Then peace returned and the soul's sovereign gaze. To the blank horror, a calm light replied, immutable, undying and unborn, mighty and mute, the Godhead in him woke and faced the pain and danger of the world. He mastered the tides of nature with a look. He met with his bare spirit, naked hell. So we can go back to the break. <clears throat> Dana. The alone discoverer in this menacing realm, guarded like termite cities from the sun, oppressed mid crowd and the tramp and noise and flame. Passing from dust to deeper, dangerous dust, he wrestled with powers that snatched from mind its light and smoked from him their clinging influences. Thank you. So Aswapati is traveling all alone. He's exploring, he's discovering these dreadful realms these menacing realms, they are threatening. They are threatening danger and suffering. Hmm? These menacing realms are protected like termite cities, protected from the sun, the light of consciousness. No? Sometimes, actually, we can see in nature films, now we see on the TV or films, we see um, how wonderful these termite cities are. Oh, they build their towers and it's all beautifully uh, uh, tunneled and cool water, air flows through and they keep it just the right temperature. Mm. But imagine if you never saw the sun, these dark underground cities. And these cities which Aswapati is passing through, they're full of people. It's another thing nowadays we sometimes see on films, no? Uh, the center of Tokyo or the center of New York. The hordes and hordes of people. So these are, uh, he, he feels the oppression of all these too many beings all around, oppressed, it crowd and tramp the tramp of the sound of all the feet and the noise and then there's flaring lights and he feels that he's passing from this dusk this half light it's getting darker and darker and as it's getting darker it's getting more and more dangerous and he feels that there are powers attacking him that are um, snatching whatever light is in the mind, they just suck it up. He has to f fight them, smite to strike them away, these clinging influences. They're clinging close onto him. He has to try and get rid of them.
Kamala. Soon he emerged in a dim wallless space. For now, the people, tracks were left behind. He walked between wide bands of failing teeth. Around him grew a gaunt spiritual black, a threatening waste of sinister loneliness. The left mind bare to an unseen assault, an empty page on which all that will good right. Stark monsters, messages without control. Yes. <coughs> so his first is in those like termite cities, but now he uh, comes into a space, a wide open space, a place where there are many beings, is left behind. He's walking all alone between wide banks of failing Eve. It's as if on either side or on all side there are dark clouds and it's getting darker and darker like evening falling. And around him he feels this spiritual blank, gaunt, it means like a face or a visage that has seen a lot of suffering, that has become old and worn because of suffering, a gaunt spiritual blank, an emptiness. But that Emptiness is threatening, menacing, like the cities were. Hmm? A threatening waste. It's a waste space. It's not that there's trees and fields and so on. A sinister loneliness. Sinister also has the idea of threatening. There's something with evil intentions in the atmosphere. And this whole blank, this gaunt spiritual blank, blank, it's as if it's leaving his mind empty so it can be attacked by anything, seen or unseen. It's like his mind is an empty page on anything that wants to can write dreadful messages, star monstrous messages and he's not able to control that. The mind has become a blank and all these dreadful thoughts can come in and there's no possibility of control. And why is this a spiritual blank? Well, it's a, there's all, all, everything that has to do with spirit has gone away. You know, it's empty. Suresh. The traveling dark from the downward course of death, with barren trees and barren barns and struggling pet, and the few cook and phantasmal trees. He faced a sea of death. And conscious world. Yes. So this traveling dot, it's as if we're seeing King Aswapati from a, uh, from a great distance, from a, a, a drone or something. We see him just like a, a little dot hmm? moving on these roads that are going down and down and the further down they go, the darker they get. And the surroundings, it's like an agricultural landscape, but a very sad and neglected one. Barren fields, fields where nothing grows. There are barns, barns are where you store your harvest or your animals, and straggling huts here and there. There are some 
her huts and a few trees, but they are very crooked. It's obviously not a good place for trees to grow. And they are phantasmal, they look like ghosts. Mm. Asvapati is facing a sense of death and conscious emptiness. A slava. But still, a hostel drives and sees us there, whose is like poets resisting light and through main link, a blue gap in narrative. He heard the grisly voices that night, saved by two thoughts, thoughts that one like sexual hopes, a prey to the staring handles of the gloom and terror approaching with the Shield. To shield his spirit from despair, but felt the horror of the growing night and the abyss ready to drive his soul. Mm -hmm. So he's facing this sense of death and conscious void, but there's still some kind of life is persisting there, but it's a hostile life. It is threatening and it's unseen. It also is threatening death, death like poise. It's resisting light and truth. So it turns this fact of living into a bleak gap in nullity. Nullity again is nothingness. There's just, there's nothing there. There's a, a space, an empty space, a space with nothing bright in it. He heard the grisly voices that deny. Grisly voices, voices that make you feel fear or terror, that deny, that deny life and hope and truth. No? He's attacked, assailed, it means being attacked on all sides by thoughts that swarmed like spectral hordes. When Sri Aurobindo uses this word swarmed, we can think of a swarm of bees. No? But these are uh, like armies, hordes are armies, and they are ghostly armies. He feels that he's prey, he's being hunted, that these staring phantoms, these ghosts, these ghostly figures of the darkness, the gloom, he feels they are uh, hunting him, and he feels terror, extreme fear approaching him with its lethal mouth. If that mouth gets hold of him, that will bring death, destruction. So he's driven. There's a will, a strange will is driving him to go further and further down. There's some kind of sky above, but the sky also is threatening. It's giving a message of doom. 
of terror and despair, no? a communique. It's, uh, this message is being loudly proclaimed that there's no hope, only disaster. So in this situation, Asvapati is struggling, striving to protect his spirit from despair. But still he can't help feeling the horror. It's not only fear, it's also disgust of the growing night. This darkness which is getting stronger and stronger. And the abyss, this uh, emptiness which is coming up to claim his soul, to swallow him up completely. Alexander. Mm. Then cease their bones of creatures and their forms, and solitude wrapped him in his voiceless folds. All vanished suddenly like a thought expunged. His spirit became an empty listening gulf, <coughs> void of the dead illusion of the world. Nothing was left not even an evil face. He was alone with a great might and might. A dense and nameless nothing, conscious, mute, which seemed alive, but without body or mind, blasted all beings to annihilate, that it might be forever mute and soul. All right, thank you. So th there were some fields, some huts and all that, but now he's gone beyond even that. Then ceased the abodes, the dwelling places of creatures. There are no forms of creatures anymore. He feels completely surrounded, enveloped in solitude, aloneness. And all forms vanished suddenly. There's nothing. It's like a thought that's just been wiped away. Aswapati's spirit became an empty, listening gulf, a big empty space, which is empty of the dead illusion of a world. Before there had been some kind of feeling of a world, an appearance, forms, but that has gone, nothing, nothing was left, not even an evil face. King Asvapati is left all alone with this grey python knight. A python is a very big, strong snake that wraps you in its coils and swallows you up, crushes you and swallows you up. That's as if that grey python night is thick, nameless, nothing. It has consciousness, but it's silent. It seems to be alive, but it doesn't have a body or a mind. But what it does have is this lust, this strong desire to annihilate, to destroy, to destroy everything, all beings, that that uh, grey python knight can be all alone forever, empty, naked, alone as if nothing else should exist but that nothingness. Rani. As in a shapeless beast, intangible jaws, ripped, stretched, 
strangled by that lusty, viscous blob, attracted to some black and giant mouth, and swallowing throat and a huge belly of doom, his being from its own vision disappeared, drawn towards depths that hungered for its fall. A formless void oppressed his struggling brain, a darkness grim and cold benumbed his flesh, a whispered gray suggestion chilled his heart. Hailed by a serpent force from its warm home and dragged to extinction in bleak vacancy, life clung to its seat with cords of gasping breath. Lapped was his body by a tenebrous tongue. All right. It's really horrifying, no? Huh? So it's that gray python night is swallowing him up. He's being swallowed by this, the intangible jaws of this shapeless beast. It's gripping him. He's strangling, it's strangling him. It's holding him tighter and tighter. But it's something kind of formless. Viscous means sticky. It's just a blot, a short, but it's swallowing him up. He's even, he's even being attracted to it. This happens, no? We, we hear that people who are attacked by animals, they get, uh, there's a kind of attraction. They're getting drawn in to the black and giant mouth and the swallowing throat and that huge python belly of doom. So he loses sight of himself. His being from its own vision disappeared as he's drawn down into these depths that are hungering for him, for his being to to fall. This, This emptiness is formless. But it's oppressing, it's oppressing his brain, which is struggling to keep some consciousness and light. The, the flesh, the body, is becoming cold and numb, um, oppressed by this darkness. And something is whispering to his heart. A grey suggestion that this is it. This is the death. No, he's being hailed, co- pulled. He can't resist. Pulled by this serpent force. No, his life is being pulled by this serpent force from its warm home in the body. No, it's being dragged out dragged to extinction in this bleak, cold emptiness. Life is trying to hold on to its seat with cords of gasping breath. But his whole body is being lapped up like a cat lapping milk by a tenebrous tongue. Mother's made a drawing of this how he feels himself being uh, lapped up by this shadowy tongue. This is the state of death. I think this is the state of passing through death. I mean, perhaps not all deaths are like this, but uh, this is a very unpleasant kind of death. Hmm? Where did I stop? A tenebrous tongue. A tenebrous tongue. It's a tongue of shadows. No? Uh, 
Uh, Alice. Existence smothered, travailed to survive, hope strangled, perished in his empty soul. Belief and memory abolished, died, and all that helps spirit in its course. There crawled through every tense and aching nerve, leaving behind its poignant, quaking trail, a nameless and unutterable fear. As a sea nears the victim bound and still, the approach alarmed his mind for every moment of an impact eternity of pain inhuman and intolerable. Yes, thank you. So there's this struggle to survive. Hope is gone. There's no hope anymore. Even no belief, no memory. <clears throat> it's all gone. Everything that would help and support the spirit has gone. Instead, through the whole body, through every tense and aching nerve of the body, is um, is this fear, nameless and unutterable fear, and it leaves a a trail, yeah, an impression. Mm. So Sri Aurobindo gives us this picture of, a, of somebody who's been um, tied up in the sea and the sea is going to rise. Mm. As a sea nears a victim who's been who can't move. He feels approaching like the sea rising. His mind now is dumb, but he can feel this threat of something coming. An eternity without any end, implacable, without any mercy or softness or slackening, nothing. An implacable eternity of pain. And not just ordinary pain, intolerable, inhuman pain. This is the threat of hell, no? eternal suffering. Will you read, please? Hmm? This he must view is both of heaven and strange. He must ever exist without extensions, please. In a slow suffering time of torture space, an unhushed nothingness is endless state, and lifeless vacancy was now his first. And in the place where once was luminous thought, one lay remained like a thin, motionless fish, an incapacity for faith and hope, and the dread conviction of their vanquished soul, immortal still but with its forehead lost, self-loss and God and sight of happier woes. Thank you. Yes. So, we will find later on that Savitri herself passes through something like this in Book 10, Canto 1. This is so obviously some kind of experience which can come of a hostile death. This conviction, there's a suggestion that it's always going to be like this. He has to bear this uh, implacable eternity of pain. 
that's inhuman, unbearable, but still it has to be borne. There's no relief. He's going to have to bear this. All his hopes of reaching heaven have taken away. They're estranged. He feels that he must exist forever without the peace of extinction. He's going to have to endure in this slow, suffering time and tortured space. This state will have no end. This state of nothingness, which is full of anguish, of suffering. No? He can't feel his life or his heart. A lifeless vacancy was now his breast. And in the place where once was luminous thought, there's nothing left except a pale, motionless ghost. The sense of being unable to feel faith or hope. The, the sense of being absolutely certain there's no possibility of it being any different. Only this dread conviction of a vanquished soul. A soul that has been conquered. It's still immortal. It's going to have to go on existing forever and ever. But it's lost its divinity. It's lost itself. It's lost God. It's lost all touch, contact with any happier worlds. I think the experience that is described of Savitri in that realm of darkness when she's lost sight of Satyavan, it is something similar. This is some kind of suggestion which must come on the soul. That uh, there can never be anything but this suffering. It will just go on and on and on forever. But he, Asvapati, endured. He stilled the vain terror. He does manage to bear it. And this feeling that, oh, the fear is useless, so I have to calm it. No? He is able to bear this feeling of being wrapped up in a snake, a strong, powerful, crushing snake, the smothering coils of agony and a fright of fear. He bears all that. Then peace returned and the soul's sovereign gaze. He is able to regain control and consciousness of himself to that blank horror which he's been experiencing a calm light replied immutable unchanging undying and unborn immortal mighty powerful Mute, silent, the Godhead, the divine part in him, woke up and faced all the pain and danger of the world. With his powerful gaze, he mastered the tides of nature, the flowing uh, movements of nature. He keeps them all fixed, steady. It's dreadful what he has to face, but he's able, strong enough to face it. He met with his bare spirit, naked hell. He has no protection. All he's got 
is this uh, divine strength within him, the strength of his bare spirit. So we might think that is enough, but uh, Sri Aurobindo has something more to tell us about the world of falsehood, the mother of evil and the sons of darkness. How has all this come about? How could it possibly happen? So we'll take that up next time. A lone discoverer in these menacing realms, guarded like termite cities from the sun, oppressed mid crowd and tramp and noise and flare, passing from dusk to deeper dangerous dusk, he wrestled with powers that snatched from mind its light and smote from him their clinging influences. Soon he emerged in a dim, wallless space. For now the peopled track were left behind. He walked between wide banks of failing eve. Around him grew a gaunt spiritual blank, a threatening waste, a sinister loneliness that left mind bare to an unseen assault, an empty page on which all that willed could write stark, monstrous messages without control. A travelling dog on downward roads of dusk, mid barren fields and barns and straggling huts and a few crooked and phantasmal trees, he faced a sense of death and conscious void. But still, a hostile life unseen was there, whose death-like poise, resisting light and truth, made living a bleak gap in nullity. He heard the grisly voices that deny. Assailed by thoughts that swarmed like spectral hordes, a prey to the staring phantoms of the gloom and terror approaching with its lethal mouth. Driven by a strange will down, Ever down, the sky above a communique of doom, he strove to shield his spirit from despair, but felt the horror of the growing night 
and the abyss rising to claim his soul. Then ceased the abodes of creatures and their forms, and solitude wrapped him in its voiceless folds. All vanished suddenly, like a thought expunged. His spirit became an empty, listening gulf void of the dead illusion of a world nothing was left not even an evil face he was alone with the grey python night A dense and nameless nothing, conscious, mute, which seemed alive but without body or mind, lusted all beings to annihilate that it might be forever nude and sore. As in a shapeless beast's intangible jaws, gripped, strangled by that lusting, viscous block, Attracted to some black and giant mouth and swallowing throat and a huge belly of doom. His being from its own vision disappeared, drawn towards depths that hungered for its fall. A formless void oppressed his struggling brain. A darkness grim and cold benumbed his flesh. A whispered grey suggestion chilled his heart. Hailed by a serpent force from its warm home and dragged to extinction in bleak vacancy, life clung to its seat with cords of gasping breath. Lapped was his body by a tenebrous tongue. Existence smothered, travailed to survive. Hope strangled, perished in his empty soul. Belief and memory abolished, died and all that helps the spirit in its course. There crawled through every tense and aching nerve, leaving behind its poignant quaking trail, a nameless and unutterable fear. As a sea nears a victim, bound and still, the approach alarmed his mind forever dumb of an implacable eternity 
of pain, inhuman and intolerable. This he must bear, his hope of heaven estranged. He must ever exist without extinction's peace in a slow suffering time and tortured space and anguished nothingness, his endless state. A lifeless vacancy was now his breast, and in the place where once was luminous thought only remained like a pale, motionless ghost, an incapacity for faith and hope, and the dread conviction of a vanquished soul, immortal still, but with its Godhead lost, self-lost, and God and touch of happier worlds. But he endured, stilled the vain terror, bore the smothering coils of agony and affright. Then peace returned and the soul's sovereign gaze to the blank horror a calm light replied immutable undying and unborn Mighty and mute, the Godhead in him woke and faced the pain and danger of the world. He mastered the tides of nature with a look. He met with his bare spirit naked hell.